right? The one that God has for you. That's, that's what we should be, uh, that's what we should be doing. Ephesians chapter six, if you would, uh, today. This is the last in our series. We've actually spent the last two summers uh, studying through this book. And so we're gonna get to the, to the very last sermon and uh, looking forward to teaching this to you. I'm gonna talk to you today about spiritual warfare. And uh, there's a lot to unpack. I'm gonna try to kind of get you to understand what spiritual warfare is. And then um, we're gonna spend a few minutes on how that spiritual warfare actually takes place. What does it look like? And then how to win when you're engaged in spiritual warfare. One thing that, that you ought to um, at least open your mind to today, right, is that, that whether you want to think about it or not, acknowledge it or not, whether you understand it or not, you are engaged in spiritual conflict. And Satan is real, and he is seeking to destroy your life, to discourage you, defeat you, to put you in bondage, to cause you to live less than, and we sang about that this morning, less than God intends for you to do. So here we are, Ephesians chapter 6, let's start in verse 10. I, I like this. Here's Paul's conclusion. Paul is going to teach us a lot about uh, conclusions of sermons, right? It's going to be a lengthy conclusion. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. That word wiles is schemes or strategies or methodologies. It is the devices of Satan that he uses to defeat us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, so come back to emphasize the same thing, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> if you know anything about the church at Ephesus, you, you really sometimes could go back and study at the very end of Acts 18 and then all of Acts 19 and then a good portion of Acts 20 is centered on Paul's initial experience with the city of Ephesus. And in the city of Ephesus, he encountered what you can describe as nothing other than real spiritual warfare, opposition, really satanic opposition. And out of that conflict, out of that spiritual warfare and conflict, the church of Ephesus was birthed. It doesn't take much to study the church at Ephesus and to see in that culture in context that the signs of evil are everywhere. If you look at the day in which we're living, the signs of evil are everywhere. Evil is complex. In fact, it's too simplistic or reductionist to say that evil can only be explained by science by natural causes or by some psychological or sociological analysis of human behavior. What this text is gonna teach us and, and the reality that you have to open your mind and heart to today is that evil at its core exists in the spiritual realm and it, evil, is not just everywhere, it is coming at you. Evil is coming at you. 
And the only thing that you and I can do to inoculate yourselves against this spiritual warfare is, here's what Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. He says to armor up, to prepare for spiritual warfare. And let's talk about this. If you have your outline, you can follow along. Hopefully this will be a help to you. I'm gonna explain a little bit about the reality of spiritual warfare, and then we're gonna get into some instruction and hopefully out of that instruction, a little bit of inspiration. First of all, the reality of spiritual warfare. For some of you, if you have a more secular, modern view or bent in your worldview, spiritual warfare can be a, a difficult subject. In fact, we have a tendency to sometimes to want to um, underestimate evil by pretending that evil does not exist by thinking, well, that's something that just, you know, religious and, and maybe weak-minded people or, or people from lesser cultures might experience, and that can be problematic. If you're a religious person, you have, may have, or a moral person, you may have a tendency to overestimate evil and you have this sense of futility. In other words, Satan is to blame for every single thing that goes on in life and you are helpless to do anything against it. And actually Paul is gonna tell us in this passage, he's gonna underline and make this case, don't overestimate evil and certainly don't underestimate evil, which tells us then that evil actually exists. And if you look at your outline, it exists in the spiritual realm. Here's what he says. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So evil exists beyond flesh and blood. There are forces of evil. There's power of evil that are behind the murder, the violence, the corruption, the greed, the racism and poverty that exists in the world. In other words, every place you look in the world where you see that things are coming apart, there's oppressive governments, there's, there's broken economic systems, there's, there's racial animosity, there's violence that's being perpetrated and abuses towards vulnerable people. And, and you can't explain all of that by simply saying, hey, we have faulty, broken institutions or philosophy or worldviews. There's a force a, a spiritual energy that is behind the evil. You say, explain to us where evil comes from. Well, that's kind of difficult in, in like a 35 minute sermon, but really quickly. So at the very top of, of God's creation, you have angels and you have humans. And both angels and humans, by exercising free will, rejected God turned away from him, and by exercising their free will to turn away from God, both angels, fallen angels, and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they exercised their free will, they turned from evil, and in the heart of angels and in the heart of humans, there's the capacity because of free will, there is the reality of evil that is lurking in every single human heart. That's the reality exists in the spiritual realm. We, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of, uh, of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in uh, high places. This is an evil day. So evil exists in the spiritual realm. So there's a reality of it. But then secondly, evil is a force that looks to attack you. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna make a big deal about this, uh, and, and certainly it's a point to the sermon, but it's not, it's not something I want you to get too deep on. I, 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 I'm gonna illustrate it in a way that maybe help you understand it. He uses this term, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So think, if, if America was under attack today, and, and thank God it's not, and the likelihood of it being under attack is... Is, is incredibly small, but if America was under attack, you say, well, you know, a hostile nation is firing rockets at us or, or armaments at us, the likelihood out of, you know, some 400, nearly 400 million people live in America, you being hit by a rocket is probably fairly small, right? Because of how far away the rockets are being launched at you. If you're within gunshot range, 
if somebody can take a rifle and shoot it at you, the likelihood of you being injured, harmed, killed is going to go up fairly significantly because the enemy is closer to you, right? If you find yourself in hand-to-hand -hand combat, if you are wrestling with evil, you are in a life and death struggle. Here's what Paul is saying. Not only does evil exist in the spiritual realm, but unless, unless you're completely oblivious, you need to see that you and I are in hand-to-hand -hand combat. We are wrestling against this evil force that has come to attack you. This is important. Sociological and psychological factors can aggravate and accentuate the evil, but they do not create it. It is already there. Evil is coming at you. If nothing else today, I want you to account for the possibility that evil exists in the spiritual realm, and it's a force, not just in the world, but it's a force in your life. You cannot, it is impossible to explain away evil in the academic or in academic, psychological, sociological, political, or moral terms. You cannot explain the violence, the racism, the, 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 the world war, the Holocaust, or modern day rejection of morality simply by the lack of education, culture, or through political philosophies and ideologies. Evil comes on you in spiritual ways. Let me, let me say this to you, and I want you, I want you to stay with me, and, and I'm gonna try to get this real practical in a moment. Back in the 1600s, so about, about 75, 80 years after the Reformation, if you know anything about history and church history, Reformation was this kind of reorientation of the church and church's belief around the gospel of Jesus. It was a rediscovery of the inspiration and authority of scripture and, and within 75 years, um, Richard Baxter, who was a preacher in England, wrote a, what, what is a fairly, if you're, if you're aware of these things, a fairly common, well-known um, article, sermon, book on the causes of what he called depression or melancholy. Melancholy was the 16th or the 17th century word for depression. And he said there are physical causes. And so if you're, if you're going through physical causes of depression, what you need is either medicine or you need rest or you need food. You need something to address the physical cause of the problem of depression in your life. And then he said there's psychological causes. And if you have a psychological root cause to the issues in your life, what you need is you need encouragement, relational help. You need reaffirmation. You need love. You need the support from people to help you through the difficulty. And then he said that there were... Um, uh, not just psychological, physical, but there's moral causes to depression. In other words, you could, you could behave in a way that shame and guilt take over your life and you're trapped in melancholy and depression. But then, and, and what was then groundbreaking, and yet even in today in the modern world, it's diminished. Baxter said, there are spiritual, demonic causes to depression. In other words, evil and or evil is responsible. Satan is responsible for the depression and melancholy that exists in your life. So here's my point to you. There's the reality of spiritual warfare. Evil exists and it's coming at you. It's coming at you relentlessly. Do you see that? And it may be at the cause of those struggles that you're having in your own life. Secondly, let's talk about this, the nature of spiritual warfare. I enjoy teaching. I do a lot of pre-work to help our, our teaching team um, organize and prepare um, foundationally what we're going to teach um, week by week. This is one of these <clears throat> sermons that as I was preparing and, and working on and, and helping them to get prepared to communicate this weekend on all of our campuses and all of our services, I, I just kind of had a, had a fresh look. This is, 
this is a, a fascinating study. And hopefully I can, I can get this maybe in a way that I've not said to you previously. I want you to underline the word wiles in verse number 12. And depending upon what kind of version of the Bible you're using, it could be schemes, it could be strategies, it could be devices. There, there's all sorts of methodologies. There's all sorts of ways that Satan comes at you. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Oftentimes, we think in terms of spiritual warfare in, in the context of, hey, Satan is going to do something in our life that hurts us, when in reality, the most common word for Satan or translated for the devil in the Bible is the Greek word diablos, which you would commonly transliterate as diabolical, but to be diabolical means that you're a deceiver and a liar. So the spiritual warfare that you are most likely experiencing in your life, the spiritual warfare that you are struggling with is an internal warfare and it is Satan trying to convince you of something that is not true. He's trying to convince you to think out of line or out of alignment with the truth of God. There, there, there's two, I'm mean, gonna try to get really practical for a moment. Let's deep dive, get, get your, your deep dive mind in this. This is not half listening to me and half thinking about what you're gonna order at lunch, right? Don't, don't, don't order lunch on your phone while I'm, right? Don't do that. Listen. Ephesians 4, if you just turn over one page, there's a really interesting little analogy that Paul makes. He says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What he's really saying is, do not be overcome with an anger that is unrighteous because when you do, you give a foothold to Satan. Satan uses that. So he uses what is happening in your emotional life as a means to convince you of things that are not true and those things become strongholds, they become places where Satan works. There's another place, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, where, where Paul gives a warning and he actually gives a warning to young ministers and he says to them to be, to be wary of or be careful about pride because pride becomes a condemnation or a snare of the devil. In other words, you can be thinking things in your mind, you can be feeling things in your heart, and the things that you are thinking in your mind that are not true, and the things that you're feeling in your heart that are not valid, are the ways that Satan is gonna come after you. Thomas Brooks, a Puritan writer, said this. He said, Satan does not leave fang marks on your flesh. He leaves lies in your heart because you're a liar. The vast majority of you that are struggling today in your life, the vast majority of you that, that are not living to, to the fullness of life, you're not flourishing, you've got these, these things that have got a grip on you, they are not outward, they're inward, and you're believing things in your life that Satan wants you to believe that are absolutely not true. Let me show you two of them. This is how Satan's gonna attack you. First of all, the devil will attack you with temptation. He will always attack through temptation. If you think about what did, Jesus, what did Satan do to Adam and Eve in the garden? He tempted them. What did Adam and Eve, or what did, what did Jesus do to Jesus? What did Satan do to Jesus? See, my mind's thinking about what I'm gonna eat for lunch too. <laughs> I'm so good at multitasking, I probably could order lunch while I'm preaching to you, but I won't do that, all right? So, what did Satan do to Jesus in the wilderness? He tempted him. If Satan is going to use as a strategy temptation to the first humans on the face of the earth, and he's gonna use temptation as a strategy to the ultimate human, Jesus Christ on the face of the earth, he's gonna use temptation in your life. You say, okay, well, what is temptation? Temptation is when you have a too high view of yourself and a too low view of the holiness of God. Now, you, you gotta stay with me for a moment. 
when Satan tempts you, he plays down God's holiness and he plays up God's love. When Satan tempts you, he's hiding from you how much God hates your sin, how destructive your sin is, how absolutely devastating it is for you to commit sin and what he's trying to get you to do is to, is to see in that, that, that temptation that whatever it is that you're about to do is really not all that bad. And there's good justification for you to go ahead and do something that is sinful, that is gonna break the, 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 the moral law of God because after all, God loves you so much that there's just no way that God's going to punish you for what you do. Let me say this to you. The sin that is most likely destroying your soul is a sin that you do not see. The sin that is most likely destroying your soul may be things that other people see clearly in your life, but you're oblivious to it because Satan has covered up the holiness of God. Okay, let, me, let me explain this to you just, just quickly. I want you to think about this. In temptation, here's Satan's devices. He will show you the bait, but he'll hide the hook. I was just on a spiritual mission a couple of weeks ago. I hated to do this, but it, I, was, I was forced to. I went fly fishing in Montana. And I, I, I tried to get out of it, but I couldn't, so I forced myself to do it, right? One of the fascinating things about fly fishing, I'm just kidding, I just loved, I love to do it, right? One of the fascinating things about fly fishing, right, is you, you're trying to catch these big trout on this tiny little hook. And I'm telling you, that hook is so small, you think there is no possible way that that hook is gonna catch that big of a fish. And the most remarkable thing is that that fly that's attached to that hook is, is tiny, right? The fly is designed to do two things, right? It's designed to grab the attention of the fish, to get the fish to focus on the fly so that the fish sees the fly but doesn't see the what? The hook. You know what temptation is doing in your life? Satan is showing you the bait, but he's not showing you the hook. He's showing you what you could get if you do. He's not telling you what you're likely to experience when you do. Here's his device in temptation. He displays sin as virtue. Now, now, so this is going to get home to some of us more religious people, right? I'll give you an example. I'm not greedy. I'm just frugal. Well, your frugality, right, is what Satan has convinced you is your moral virtue when what you're actually is you're very stingy in your heart and you're unwilling to share what God has blessed you with. That's temptation. Here's temptation. I know Christian leaders who have failed and I'm not doing things that are as bad as they do. You're looking around and you're comparing yourself to other people and you're actually creating your own standard of righteousness based on how you behave as in comparison to how other people behave. Or here's one, I want you to listen to this for a moment. Satan, caught, this is temptation, causes you to be bitter over your suffering. So you've gone through some really incredibly hard things in your life. And there are areas of your life that aren't aligned with what God wants it to be, but you justify your actions and your attitudes because of what you have suffered. And so what you're doing is you're justifying living outside of the realm of God's will for your life because you say, hey, after all, nobody suffered like me. That's temptation. 
What you're doing is you are listening to Satan's devices. You're giving a stronghold to him. You're giving him a platform to get control of your heart. And you're actually, listen to me, you're believing lies that are not true because you've diminished in your life the holiness of God and, and you're thinking that somehow God's gonna make a way out. Now let's flip it around, right? That's lie number one, temptation. Satan will attack you, number two, with accusations. Now, here, you gotta stay with me because this will, I'm gonna tie all this together in just a moment. Temptation is when Satan hides the holiness of God from you and he, and he elevates and he magnifies the love of God. Accusation is the reverse. It's when he hides the love of God from your heart and he intensifies and magnifies the holiness of God. Now, those are two completely opposite things. When you are under accusation, you are now believing things about you that though they may be true, the whole truth can't be viewed if you don't account for the love of God, the unmatched, the, un, the, the boundless love of God, the mercy of God in your life. The devil is gonna make accusations against your heart. By the way, can I tell you this? The, accus, the, the devil makes accusations against me. Like, like and, and I'm only saying this and trying to be transparent enough to get you to understand that. Like, sometimes, the, I, I don't hear a voice. The only voice I fear in my life is when Lisa says, well, she, and sometimes she doesn't even say things. She taps me under the table on my leg. That's, I, I'm either doing something or saying something I'm not supposed to be doing or saying. I don't hear a voice from Satan, but he speaks things to my heart. Like, like some, and, and when I say that, I, I do not need you to be empathetic towards me at all. I do not need that. I, I, it would be awkward for me if you, if you try to be. Sometimes Satan will say to me, you know what? You're, you're getting so old that you, you're irrelevant, right? And, and so sometimes I'll think, yeah, that's probably true. You know, I've been doing this a long time. I've said everything I could ever possibly think in my life. In fact, I'm at the point in my life where I'm making things up because I just don't know what else to say, right? <laughs> and, if, and if I don't have a way to combat that, I, I begin to believe that lie. Or, or sometimes I'll think, you know, really this thing in your life is a limiter and it's and and if you were in the way it could the, the whole thing could be better than it is right and what i'm doing is i'm i'm magnifying the one side the holiness of god to the, to the neglect of the of the of the love of god listen to revelation 12 and verse 10 this is important i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of god and the power of his Christ for the accuser, which is Satan, of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan is relentlessly trying to convince you in your heart that God doesn't love you, that you're not good enough, that you're inadequate. John Newton, who famously wrote uh, Amazing Grace, he was a, he was a, a, a a, a, a tra he, he was a ship captain of a, of a ship that ran slave trade. He miraculously was converted, became a pastor. And he's famous for these letters that he wrote to people that would write him about problems in their life. And a young man who was a Christian who was preparing for ministry became very depressed. He was under Satan's attack. And he, and he wrote to Newton and said, I am so awful, God can't love me. Now, John Newton, <clears throat> who was incredibly wise, um, wrote back, knowing that he's going through this accusation, he says, you cannot be too aware of, your, of all your inward and inbred sins. <laughs> what he's actually saying is, you're right, you are, um, you are a terrible person. But you may be, indeed you are improperly affected by them. What Newton was actually saying is this, you, you express not only a low opinion of yourself, which is a right view to have, but you also equally hold a too low opinion of the person, work, and the promises of the Redeemer, which is certainly wrong. In fact, the only way that you can have a healthy view of yourself 
is to see yourself accurately for who you are and what you are, but while you're looking at your flaws and your sinfulness, you see a Savior who is incredibly forgiving and loving, and he is able to forgive you in spite of all the wrong in your life. You are under accusation if you obsess over your sin. If you spend more time thinking about the failure in your life than you think about the salvation that Jesus gave to you through the cross. You are under accusation when you are convinced that your sin is the cause of all the trouble that you're going through. You give up hope about the future because you, you, you slip into moralism, I can never be good enough. Or you begin to think that the things that you're doing if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't do those things. Let me tell you something. You will be tempted in every single stage and season of your life. And Satan wants to convince you that you are not worthy of God's love. So you are either under temptation or you're under the attack of accusation and Satan is coming at you. So you say, what's the remedy? Or the power for spiritual warfare. We're going to finish this just just a minute. If I could, I'd probably rewrite this just a little bit from what I did earlier this week. But but let me let me show you. See, he starts out by saying, "Finally, my brethren, be strong, Lord, in the power of His might." How do you unleash the power of God in this spiritual warfare? How do you get the strength of the Lord, the power of God's might? How is it that you equip yourself so that when you find yourself in a death, life and death struggle, hand-to-hand combat with it, how do you make it? How do you get the strength in this wrestling match with Satan? I'm gonna give it to you really quick. Ready? Number one, you have to put on the whole armor of God. He says it twice. Verse number 11 and verse 13. And he doesn't say put on the armor of God. He actually says put on the whole armor of God. Whole armor. W-H-O-L-E. Underline that word. Circle that word. Whole armor of God. Because the, half the armor is this. God's holy. Half the armor is this. God's loving. The whole armor of God is when you can actually take both elements of that and you reconcile them together and you see that God's infinite holiness is above and beyond anything that you could ever imagine, but his love is so incredibly majestic and boundless and adequate and sufficient that it doesn't matter how far you have fallen, God's grace can reach you and it can encompass you, it can redeem you, it can restore you, it can renew you, it can reconcile you, it can make you a child of God. See, you have to have both. You have to see that the only reason that you have power against Satan is because the one person who was wholly armored stripped himself and became naked, made himself vulnerable, took off all of his armor, and took on the responsibility for your sin. He owned your shame and your guilt, and he paid for your debt in full so that Satan's temptations and accusations would be rendered absolutely useless against you. And when you look at Jesus, you actually can look at him and say, Satan, bring it on, because in Jesus, the truth and the peace and the righteousness is not mine. They are given to me by Jesus Christ. I am not who Satan says I am. I am who Jesus says I am. Do you get that? You gotta put on the whole armor of God. But then secondly, you gotta tap into the power of prayer. And that's what he says. Praying always. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching like a spiritual watchman, like a watchman on the wall of a city. You see, the battle's not yours, it belongs to God. And you engage in spiritual warfare by enlisting God's help through prayer. 
Some of you may be old enough to remember this. Remember the, the old gospel song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus? There's a little piece in that, in that hymn, right? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on in what? Prayer. You put it on. C.S. Lewis, enemy occupied territory. That's what the world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Doesn't it make sense? If you think about it, to make use of our air coverage, the power of prayer. You say, when Satan tempts me, pray. When Satan accuses me, pray. And when you pray, pray on the gospel armor. As we finish, not just this sermon, but this series, I want you to think about this. This is in the bottom of your outline. Just take that sheet for a moment. What is it, if, if you could engage in this on a personal way, what is it you're battling in your life today? What, what, what is the spiritual warfare? Is it accusation? Is Satan accusing you of things that you know are not, in your heart you know they're not true, but you're believing in them and acting on them? Is it temptation or the things you're struggling with where, where he's hidden the holiness of God from you? What is it? And, and, and you don't have to show it to me. You don't have to show it to anybody else. You can, right? But I'm battling. And then whatever it is in your life that you're battling, I want you to think about that today. If you don't identify it, if you don't get an attack for it, if you don't begin to armor up, that, that relentless attack of Satan is gonna discourage you and defeat you. It's gonna leave you in bondage. But then here's another question. Who do you know that's in a spiritual struggle? See, almost, almost without exception, every week people will talk to me about somebody in their life that is struggling. Somebody in their life that, that just needs to win a spiritual battle. Who do you know that's struggling spiritually? I'm praying for, just write their name in there. I'm praying for whoever that is because they're going through the temptation, the accusations in your life, in their life. Let's stand together for prayer. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. <clears throat> Maybe really try to be as pointed and helpful as I can be. May, may be hard for you to admit this and I, I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, but I wanna help you. Maybe some of you would, would just need to acknowledge today that you're in a spiritual struggle. The temptation and the accusation is, has become more relentless to you and you feel powerless against it. And so you're in discouragement, depression. You're living in, a, in, in anxiety over it. You're, you're, you're living a defeated life. You say, I'm in a spiritual battle. Would you pray for me? Just heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just lift that hand up high. I know for me to see it. Say, Pastor, include me in closing prayer. I'm in a spiritual battle in my life and I need God to help me. Maybe you'd say this, I know somebody, somebody close to me, somebody I care deeply about, they're in a spiritual battle and I'm praying for them. Would you just lift that hand up for a moment? Let's use this opportunity. The altar's open. Let's use this opportunity to go to battle with Satan, to put on the gospel arm and to bathe the armor in prayer as we seek not just to prepare for spiritual warfare, but to win, not because of you, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. Father, speak to our hearts. Make truth become real to us. May we rest in, even revel in, the truth that you are both infinitely holy and at the same time uh, abounding in love and mercy so that our sins do not have to overwhelm us, that we can be forgiven and be whole because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.